ask you here, we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about inlaying. I, I've done a lot of inlaying over the years and I've picked up a lot of tips mm -hmm. from other people, like we were talking about earlier. Very few of us able to invent anything. We learn from somebody else. So all these, these things I'm going to show you and talk about today, I picked up from somebody else. I didn't come up with any of them. And, uh, over time, you, you, you find out that there are things you can use and things you can't use. So I, I pretty well got my inlaying uh, stuff down to items that I can use. I handed you a little handout here just to give you some history. Inlaying has been around about as long as man's been around. Uh, pharaohs in the tombs, they had inlaid materials. Thing that got me, they inlaid ebony and they inlaid ivory. What did they saw them with? You know, it, I can saw, try to saw ebony today with a modern saw is not easy. And, and they were somehow able to do it. We, we, in this day and time, we forget what a person can do with their hands. We're so used to equipment and machinery and things like that that we, we just don't mm -hmm. understand what you can't, what can yeah. be done with your hands. So inlay has been around a long time. Uh, it, it reached its peak probably in uh, 15th, 16th century France under under the, the kings there they did a lot and still do the, Fr the French are still excellent inlayers marketers they stole that craft from the Italians the Italians were the first well the Italians stole it from the, from the um, Iranians and the Middle Easterners they had it before the Italians had it those guys probably got it from, like everything else, from the Chinese. Look at Chinese inlay today, it's still top notch. So all that information came from China, came from the Middle East, came through came through uh, Italy, up into Europe, and then eventually uh, to England and, uh, and across uh, to us. The inlay reached its peak in this country as far as furniture goes, around 1800 to 1810 during the federal period. That was when they were getting away from curved, uh, like cabriole legs, and we're going with straight tapered legs, <laughs> like this, cleaner design. And to dress it up, they used a lot of inlay. I like that period of furniture. That's probably my favorite federal period of furniture. Uh, and like I said, that was between 1800, 1810, somewhere along there, on the East Coast. Didn't reach this part of the country till the 1820s, 1830s. We were always behind. We were the frontier. So the settlers that came out of New York, Pennsylvania, especially North Carolina, came down the Great Road into the uh, Upper East Tennessee, where the Cumberland Gap is. They came in that way. The cabinet makers did. And right there in that area where Tennessee, Virginia meet was a hotbed of really great cabinet makers. It's just enough distance for you to have left your apprenticeship in New York or Pennsylvania or somewhere and made it to East Tennessee and, and, and earned your money back and you, you're a free person that can sit up here on the shop. Uh, so that led to a whole uh, different kind of inlay, not quite as fancy as on the, on the East Coast, but a more countryfied inlay that found roots in East Tennessee and in central Kentucky, when you come down the, come down to the Cumberland, Cumberland Gap, you got your choice of going down into East Tennessee or going over into central Kentucky, and they went both ways. Those cabinet makers did with those skills. If you look at period furniture, which I, I like Tennessee furniture and Kentucky furniture from the 1830s, there's a lot of inlay on East Tennessee furniture, there's a lot of inlay on Kentucky furniture. There's not any inlay hardly ever on Middle Tennessee furniture. Very seldom you ever see inlay on Middle Tennessee furniture, and I don't know why. They just didn't do it. But the people in Kentucky and East Tennessee did. And uh, during my slide presentation later, I'll show you some pieces of furniture that are typical of East Tennessee and typical of Central Kentucky. So you can see the kind of inlay they did. It wasn't quite as fancy as what you found on the uh, East Coast in the larger cities, but it, it looked good for the furniture they were building. So. You talk about inlay, the first thing you wonder is, well, what kind of tools do you need to use? Well, I brought a bunch of tools. I didn't start out with this many. I started out with very few. This is the first scratch stock I ever made. It's broken. <laughs> but I made this years ago. 
And uh, a scratch stock is just a piece of wood that can hold a piece of steel. An old bandsaw blade works good. A scraper, an old scraper works good. Saw steel. Uh, got any old hand saws, especially the really old ones? Shear them off. They're different thicknesses usually, but boy, there's some really good steel in here and they'll make good scrapers. So once you, once you get your piece of steel, then you've got to grind it to fit the piece of stringy. We're going we're gonna to talk about string in later first. Yes. That string inlay around the drawer for me. This is string inlay down the leg. Simple, very simple, just for straightening. The, uh, uh, in order to make that little groove, you're going to use a scratch stop, which was what you couldn't very well take a chisel and try to go down through there and, and, and lay it in. And Chisels at that time were pretty healthy. You know, a quarter of an inch wide was a small chisel. So you're, need, you're talking about 16th or 30 seconds. So you need to grind down a little piece of steel, clamp it in a, a scratch stock, something that'll hold it, and then just throw it down across the wood. And it will take shavings out and leave a nice little groove to put your, put your inlay in. You can make a fancier one out of a piece of, this one's made out of a piece of aluminum. It does exactly the same thing. You know, scrape it right out. You need to not hold it straight up, but tilt it back just a little bit so that you're catching that burr on the front. And when I sharpen these, I don't, I take a wet rock one side of them, knock the burr off one side, and leave the burr on the other. And here's a little fancier one. In here. Here's a little bitty one I made for something I don't know what for, but that was for something important. Now, some country cabinet makers, they couldn't afford to do this. They couldn't get the stringing or whatever. So they just scribe a line. You'll see all on, uh, especially on antique furniture, you'll see a little scribe line around there. Just a groove cut in to give it a little decoration. They did that with what's called a scratch stock. These are scratch stocks. These are actually screw stocks. Take a, a bevel head screw, file the top so it leaves a sharp angle at the grooves, and you can run it in or out, depending on how far you want to scratch the uh, scratch to be. Draw it down across the wood, it'll make a nice little V-shaped scratch. Those are very common. I've used them, uh, if you're doing a reproduction of an antique and want to make it look just like it did when it was made, use this. These little screw stocks work very good on on cross grain. They'll cut cross grain real, real well. Draw back to the scratch stock, it does not do cross grain well at all. It chips it out. If you look at old antiques, they're chipped out. And uh, the, the, new, the new way to do it is one of these. You don't have to worry about which way the grain is. We'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. You can buy scratch stocks. Already made. I have this one, which I like a lot. It's made by Lee Valley, like the tools Lee Valley makes. It comes with a whole assortment of cutters. You can do more than just cut a groove with these scratch dots. You can put a molded edge, or like a, round, a small rounded edge on the edge of the door frame or something. Uh, you can also also make those yourself. Here's one. Made this one myself. It's another piece of hacksaw blade with a chainsaw file filed out the groove. And you can draw it down through there, make a nice little round over edge on, on anything. Works pretty good. These are the kind of tools that a, a cabinet maker in this part of the country in the 1800s would have been using, things like that. They, they highly prized steel. They didn't waste any of it. Uh, I've worked with people over the years and bought out shops where I could find a shop that somebody was selling everything. I'd go in with somebody and we'd buy it all. And I'll pass these around let you look at them. There was a guy who shop I bought me dog house furniture. He scraped all the moldings, every one of them, with one of those, and here in the moldings, the he made to use. 
I'll pass these around for y'all to look at them. And then here's a collection that I have made of ones that I've used over the years. This one that the Lee Valley makes, you can adjust it really, it adjusts real well. It's got nice thumb holes on it. And uh, it does a really good job. Now I've laid a piece of wood out for y'all on your benches there. I'm gonna hand some of these out, let you just try them. We need to adjust that one. Yeah, that's not adjusted, it's successful. And there we go. So, once you get your, your groove, oh, let me show you these. This is another, another style of inlay cutter. That is an inlay cutter. Made out of a piece of soft steel with a hook ground on one end and a point ground on the other. I have two different ones. I have a 364, 116th, I think, different thicknesses of steel. They work like this. You don't put a groove in here. Clamp on a straight edge. Take the hook one. <coughs> And it pulls a nice little curl right off there, makes a nice groove. <coughs> Don't know if you can see that. That, that, that works really well. And if you're trying to get up in a corner, that's what this one's for. Turn around this way, and it'll finish it right into a corner. <laughs> I'm sorry? You get to the point, are you pushing it? Just yeah, just pushing it, pushing it just a little bit, like that. Or, or come in here and go down and pull it back just a little bit. You can do it either way. And that gets you right up in the corner. I've used these. Th these work real good when you're on a leg like this. You can clamp. You can clamp your straight edge on the side of that. Drag that right down through there and cut a nice groove. This, this is still better. <laughs> but when I first started, I'll have to tell you, even using this, I still have to go back and use one of these hand tools every now and then. So there are things that that won't do. You can't get into certain places that you can with these. I'll pass these around that you get these too. And like I said earlier, you learn from everybody else. How to make these is enough in a uh, fine woodworking magazine article a number of years ago. I just copied what they did. Here's the screw stock. Now, could you use that screw stock to go across the ring? Yeah, the screw, the, screw, the screw stock with that screw head on it cuts just fine across the ring. Then could you use yeah, the, you got the other one to, to uh, clean it out? Well, yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. There's a black marker. You got, you got a screw head with a groove in it, like that. Yeah. And when you, you take file and you file the top of it nice and flat. Got a cutting surface there, cutting surface there, cutting surface there, cutting surface there. On each one of those. And you can tell if you look at those screw stocks, you can feel how sharp they are. But round one is for going around round items. Trying to follow a curve, you can use just a piece of dial. But it, it works really well. These are oh, in our inlaying tools. They're two little cheap screwdrivers. Round. Uh, yeah, y'all know what jewelers files are? Machines use jeweler's files, little small, very delicate little files. Gourmet makes the best, except they don't anymore. They don't make them in, in uh, Switzerland anymore, they make them in China. I was very disappointed. Went to buy some Gourmet files, picked it up, and it said Gourmet France, made in China. So what I keep an eye out for now is at garage sales or flea markets or somewhere, if you can find you know, where Nowadays, most machinists, old machinists are selling off everything they had because 
their stuff's ancient. Nobody uses what machinists to, used to use. Nobody. Uh, my grandfather ran a machine shop. And I learned to run a lathe in the milling machine, a shaper, all that sort of thing at the machine shop. Several years ago, I had a friend in Huntsville, Alabama, who had a machine shop. He did work for NASA. And uh, I went down to see his machine shop, walked in. I didn't recognize a single piece of equipment. Nothing. Everything was CNC. It was all these multiple head machines. He did not have a milling machine. He did not have a lathe. Had these machines with these multiple heads. Had these guys there that were about 23 or 4 years old sitting there at a computer screen running everything. So if you find a, an old machinist with a bunch of go away files and micrometers and, and dividers and stuff like that that they're selling, it, uh, there's no market for them anymore. <laughs> so, so you can get them pretty cheap. I still use them. But this is a couple of files. And uh, this has a specific use. The tip of this file, or the screwdriver, I'm sorry. This is on a cross section from the bed. This is the blade flat on. And this is the blade. We take a jeweler's file trying to do a and cut a little tiny groove down in there. So what you're looking for on the screwdriver is two little cutting surfaces right there. Little chisels. And then you grind the side of the blade down to get to the width that you want the groove to be. And I have a, a one that's maybe one about three sixteenths and the other is maybe a thirty seven of that. And what these are used for and if we can come to the uh, photographs there, let's, let's step through several photographs here. Hang on. There are places mm -hmm. when you're doing inlay that you cannot use any of these tools. The surface may be curved, so there's no flat area to put anything on. Which one? Oh, keep going. 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 Hey, look. got to keep going. That's not it. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The chest drawers with the surface in the front. Same front chest of drawers. I look at my daughter two of them. One to go inside her bed. That front drawer is curved. You can do. You can do. You can do this. You can do the inlay here to here and here to here. You can't do it here. So that's on an inside curved surface going up like this. You can't get in there with any kind of tool. But you can use these, lay it out. I have one laid out already here. Got an arc, an arc laid out here. Depending on the radius of the arc would be the width of this, but you want it to fit on the arc and not stick out behind it. So we use the narrow one. I didn't bring my mallet. And that severs the wood grain. It makes a nice little, little channel. What you come up with is wood surface is sheer. Whoops. Wood surface is sheer straight down. Like so you've got, got a little bit of a lump in the bottom there. 
You know, what are you going to use to get that out with? Well, you need a 1 16th or less width chisel. Japanese sell one, but they want a lot of money for it. But you can make one out of a jeweler's file. You grind a jeweler's file. This happens to be exactly 1 16th. And you can get in here and clean that out. If that's not enough, if, it's, if that's too big, take a Zacco knife, grind the back of it off into a chisel. And you can get in here and get out the little chips. Put a piece of tape on it so I know it's not a that I don't know about y'all, but I use but I've got a dozen of that stuff now. They're laying everywhere. And when I buy blades, I buy them by the hundred. If you're gonna go online to buy them and you do a stu a search on on uh, exacto knife blades, you'll find a bunch of them, but they're high. Cost money. If you do one on craft knife blades, then they come up way cheaper. And uh, the ones I buy are made, in, I don't know where they're made, but they, they, don't have, they don't have the exact old name on them, they got another name on them. But I bought a box from a guy on eBay, and uh, he had them for like $4 a box for 100 blades. And so I said, well, I'll buy some of those. And uh, he emailed me back and he said, I've got more if you want to buy more. And I said, how many have you got? And he said, well, around a hobby shop, said, I've got 150 boxes. And so I bought 10, 10 boxes. And he said, if you buy 10 at a time, I'll sell them to $3 a box. So I bought a lifetime supply of, of uh, blades for $30. And I've given boxes away and I still got boxes of them. Have you ever used the Persona brand? For what? The Persona brand? No, no, I only use those cheap ones I've got, the ones I ever use. That's not that's not a bad product. I always like to have a good sharp blade and if I've got so many that ain't sharp, I throw it away. And also a lot of times we use those little exacto knife blades, you try to turn a little bit of the corner, they'll snap the tip off. Don't leave them in there because if you do, you made a big mistake. But uh, I, I, I use a lot of exacto knife blades. And I just recently got this, this. I won this in an auction. This is a Kurtz tool or something like that. It, it's good. In fact, it was at a Saffron. It was at the Saffron mid year. It's pretty good. Right? You use scalpels. I use scalpels all the time. This one. And this one. Uh, I used to use these all the time until I found out about these with a the big handle on them. Uh, these are much better. But the real good one, this one. Uh, this one's made in England, and it holds a scalpel blade, and you can adjust how far it sticks out. The problem I have with these is that you bear down on this, it, it wobbles. This thing, you can just Got to shut my load. Look at this trying to get that thing to come out. Got a collet that clamps on the blade. Well, it holds it tight, that's for sure. Who makes it? I'll pass this around. A company, I just got it just a few weeks ago. A company in England makes them. And they make them for the uh, fishing trade. There they go. Use the regular, use the regular number 11. I use the number 11 blade, scalpel blade. six or seven dollars a piece, something like that, and they come with a dozen blades. So now you've got the blade in there and you can bring it down to about like that, which makes it a whole lot better to use. Marketers, marketers in England use it. I understand the English marketry is different than the marketry done on the coast, and that we've done in the, on the continent. 
Anyway, I use, I use scalpels all the time. Uh, wine bottle corks, I uh, have a lot of those to put on sharp things. Back when my daughters were younger, we'd go out to eat and be in a restaurant where they served wine and the waiter would come back cleaning the table while asking for the wine bottle corks that they had left over. My daughters hated that. <laughs> what are you asking for those for? And then I had a friend in Florida that uh, was in a wine club. He sent me a bushel basket full of wine corks. So I've got plenty of them. So you've seen how that works. I'll pass this around so you can see it. And suppose you want to cut a circle, you know, circular inlay. Well, you can make yourself a circle inlay curve. Piece of steel, pole drill through it, set screw, and an Allen wrench. Grind the Allen wrench, and it will make a nice round inlay. Uh, one of the boards that you've got there has got one on the back side. Where I did that. Main thing to remember about these cutters if you're using them on a drill press, make sure that whatever you're cutting is clamped solidly to the table. That the drill press is running at the very slowest speed it can run, and that you advance the feed very slowly. If you don't, you, you'll break one of these off, you throw the wood across the room, or who knows what might happen. I made this one myself and got that in shot. Does it work like a chisel or a scraper? They work like a, uh, they have a, a bevel ground on the bottom, so they have a, have a chisel profile on the bottom. They are kind of like that. A little longer angle. Like so that one is like that. You can see it when you look here. The breakaway. The what? The breakaway. Breakaway. Right here. I just wanted to look at it. Did you pass it? I just took the container for no, bag. Yeah, it's passed in the You have the knife? Okay, it is being passed. Oh, okay. So, once you get your groove, now that we've talked about all the ways to cut grooves, next thing you got to do is find something to put in the groove. And, uh, This is what you used to use right here. I got this off shop, I bought out. This is boxwood, boxwood stringing. Comes in different widths and thicknesses. Boxwood is a really good wood for stringing because it doesn't have a lot of grain to it, very tight grain. And uh, this is a board. It may not look like a board, but it's a board. And it'll bend this way, but it won't bend this way. And when you get, this is rectangular in cross-section. Some of this stuff is square in cross-section. You square in cross-section, you gotta make sure you're bending it the right way. So, a pair of good calipers is always good to have. This one is 364s, no, 264s. So, we're gonna have to have a cutter that will cut a groove that this will fit into. And uh, we've talked about how to get that with these scratch stocks. You just keep grinding it till you get the right thickness. And if you use one of these, you're gonna need a bit that will cut that uh, size you're looking for. Lots of people sell them bits. You want an up spiral bit is what I use. The best ones that I have found come from a company called Drill Technology. They sell a set, nine pieces, and uh, 250 thousandths, 300 thousandths, 132nd, 364s, 116th, 564s, 332nd, 764s, and an eighth. That will cut any groove you need for anything forever. And the, it's a nice set, nice little fitted case. I'll hand the thing out. Drill Technologies, $90 for that, worth every penny. And it fits the drum too. I'll pass this one out. Let's look at them. And this is the company I'm going for. Uh, that's about, that's less than half of what Stuart, Stuart McDonald sells them. And that's about half what Stuart McDonald gives them. And they're just as good. 
So we, we, we're going to put this. I'm going to go, go ahead and, and cut a groove in this right here using, whoops, using my normal tool. Some of y'all have looked at this Dremel too. This is the newer one that they make uh, that has the light built into it. Yeah. I have a, we're going to do this. Let me put this out here so you see what it looks like. The, uh, Right here, and I brought in a blank one, and I've gone around it with a pencil so that you can see where the line's going to be. And I've taken the lock that I'm going to use, and you will need to know the distance that they call between the pin center and the top of the lock itself. That's the distance from the top of your drawer to the center of the lock. Find that point first. And then this one, this lock I'm gonna use on this one, uses a quarter inch hole, uses a quarter inch hole for the key to go in. So drill a quarter inch hole all the way through. I want the stringing to line up on the points of the diamond I'm gonna inlay in there. So that's where it'll go, right there. And now we're ready to cut the groove for that. Drop the right one. I've got this thing already set up for that distance. Ryan, can you move it now? Oh, this is sorry. Right. Now I don't have the power one yet. Uh, another thing, I did not bring it. Forgot it. A foot switch. Should always run one of these things with a foot switch. Because if something starts to go wrong, you cannot find that on-off switch. Would you like to have one for tonight? I would if you got one. I, I walked off and left it. I don't run a, a, I don't run any router without a foot switch being on. Because if you run a router and that thing starts to get away from it, you, you can't turn it off. You take your foot off of it and stop. Yeah, we have more scroll saws. Yep, yep, I use mine on scroll saw too. Yep. Okay, this one is set. It needs to come in just a little bit. Is that micro adjust? Yes, just got threads on it. You can buy these little bases, off with these little adjustable bases. I made this one myself because I had the stuff to make it with. Okay, I'm right on the line there. And we're going to use, let's see if this one's the same size. I think it is. We're going to use this stringing right here. So we'll put the rider down in zero at the bottom of the cut. It's got a step stop. Release the dip stop, put the stringing in there to that depth, and tighten it down. Now, when you plunge it, you'll cut that depth. Okay, I'm ready to start with the foot switch. This one has a, this one has a neat light on it, so you see what you're doing. I have, I, the reason I use a foot switch all the time now, I have a three and a half horsepower plunge right of bell thing. That thing got away from me and jumped across my bench, across the table saw, and landed in a chair just that quick. And every time I look at my table saw, I see those three big grooves in the beginning. I think about that. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, <laughs> we'll help you turn it on. There you go. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and give it a start shot. I plunged it, locking it. And here's where you need the air pump. Stop. 
dock it just before you get to the other line. You don't want to run it through the line. Didn't bring my bench work with me, but you can see, cut a nice groove. Now we'll turn around and do the other edges. Got some efficient hold downs. They were already plunged. I, I left it plunged. I'm gonna hold the router at an angle, bring it over, and drop it even. This is where this tool comes into its own cross grain. There will be no tear out with this tool. I didn't go right into the corner. I'll do that with chisel. Okay. Who in here collects chisels? <laughs> this is my favorite chisel. It's made from a Joiner knife. It was at a woodworking um, demonstration up in Pennsylvania. A guy had this. I saw it and I said, where'd you get that? He said, I made it out of a joiner knife. So I went home and ground me one out of a joiner knife. It works great. It's like a fish tail. And you can get right, if you're doing dovetail, get right up in the corner. They sell these, but man, this thing's been great. Okay, we're gonna, I'm indexing. Tighten this down so it doesn't move around on me. I'm putting the flat side of the blade into the groove I've cut. And I'm just gonna rock it forward. I'll do the same thing over here, get it in the, against the shoulder, rock it forward. Yeah. Same thing on the inside. Rock it forward. Rock it forward. On this side. Rock it forward, rock it forward, there we go. Now, one sixteenth inch chisel. Pop out the waste. There we go. You need to see that four times. We'll just use this corner. And now I'm gonna put my stringing in. If that's the right bit, this is the right stringing. And it is. Get that. Fits right in there. Hear that? You hear that little crrr? That's what you want to hear. You want it to be tight, but you don't want to be too tight. You don't want to have to, um, this is a Warrington hammer. It's got a rounded end on the back. That's for two things, driving tacks so that you don't hit your finger and for pushing this in. That's what that's for. So that fits just, I mean just right. Now what happens to wood when you get it wet? It swells. 
So if you start putting this thing in there tight to begin with, and you put some glue in there, it's not going to go in. So let me show you what I... I use two kinds of glue. I use tight bond, just regular old tight bond. But for inlay, I use Elmer's glue. Elmer's glue all. Not Elmer's school glue. Not Elmer's carpenter's glue. Elmer's glue all. The old original Elmer's glue. And the reason is, it dries clear. This will dry with a yellow line. If you have just a little gap in it, you'll see a little yellow line. With the Elmer's glue, you don't see it. And I use Elmer's glue. I learned this from Matt Headley, who was the head cabinet maker at Williamsburg for years. He came from a five generation cabinet making a family in, in Virginia. This is the only glue they've ever used. After they quit using hide glue, they went to this. So everything, and they make furniture for the White House. If you look at the White House, that big clocks in, they built that. Those chairs and tables, they built those. And, uh, and they use this glue. So I feel like I'm safe using this glue. Is that different from the white type bond? Uh, I've never used a white type bond. Don't know anything about it. Okay. it the white type bond may be the same. The only thing I know about, about this is it will dry absolutely clear. And you can take some of that white type bond and you know, squeeze it out and see if it dries clear. When we cut the miter, I just do it by eye. Uh, you can see a reflection in the back side of your blade. And when it lines up, okay. Yeah, that looks good. I'm not, going, I'm not going to run this thing the whole way. Just use a piece of this. Have you tried fish glue? Oh uh, yeah, fish glue works good. It really does. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy out on the West Coast, uh, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, Anyway, he's a great marketer. Does all kind of marketer uh, inlay, and he uses fish glue. Yeah. I have a hypodermic needle that I've got somewhere. But I, it's important for me to show you that. That, uh, I've used lots of syringes to put glue in, and the little rubber end on always came off. And I didn't like that, so. In the group in Atlanta, we have a, two or three doctors. And I said, kind of, kind of syringe you y'all need. And they said, Microjet 400. That's what we use. <laughs> so I bought me a Microjet 400, and I've never had the rubber end come off. Well, hey, all so much stuff. <clears throat> You can show it to you, but it's just, just a plastic syringe. This, for what we're doing here, this little, and I, I put my glue in these little bottles. You can buy these off of eBay. They don't cost much. But I like using these because they, they seem to be easier to handle in them. A big glue bottle's got such a big end, stuff gets everywhere. These have this little, little small nozzles. So lay a little in the groove, like that. Put your inlay in it. And I always try to move it a little bit like that. There we have it. I usually use just plain water. I found also that the white Elmer's glue doesn't uh, stay in the wood. You know, a lot of times when you use tight bond, you wipe it off, but it's still there. Yeah, that looks good. Now we'll make a piece to go the other way. Steve Adler tells the curved tip plastic syringe with the tip started on the curve. That's what, my, that's what these micro jets look like. It's exactly like that. Yeah, they, they work really well. They do. Okay. That's it. You know what? This thing fits tighter on the cross grain. There it goes. See there? Push it right down in there.
I'm not above hitting it with a hammer, spread the wood out a little bit. That's pretty good. Now, while that is down, I will hit it with a piece of 320 sandpaper. Get a little dust so it can go in there. Now, I will not let that dry overnight before I sand it. And the reason is that if you go ahead and level that up now, it'll, tomorrow that wood will be below the surface. I learned that the hard way. So you need to let it dry overnight and then, and then level it. Uh, the front of this one, I almost didn't do right. So anyway, that gives you an idea of how to do that. And it's, as you can see, if you got the right cutter and the right stringing, it's easy. Just lay it right in there. Now, suppose this didn't fit. Suppose this was a little bit too big. It was too tight. Well, I need to adjust it. And for that, you use this right here. It's a block of wood. It's one of those little, you remember a company called AMT? We used to make tools. They had a little plane in there, and I had one, and it had this blade in it. So I screwed it on here, and you can see it's at an angle. There's a groove in here, sized to fit the biggest inlay or the biggest stringing I used. I'm clamp this in a vise. Let me do it right here. And String. You can, you, can, you can buy string it, and you're pretty limited to the wood you can use. The best, the best woods I like for stringing are either, if I can get it, boxwood. This is what boxwood looks like. It's got sort of a yellowish color to it, but it will not change. It'll stay that color. And uh, maple, I like my straight, plain, white, straight grain maple works really good. Maple will yellow over time. Then there's holly. Holly is getting expensive, hard to come by, but it will be white forever. It does not change color. And you need to watch about using holly on your different inlays and other things because it is a bright wood. It will stay really bright. And uh, sometimes on an antique, if you're making a reproduction of an antique, you don't want something that looks too bright. So usually on antique stuff, I will use, uh, I'll use maple. Now you gotta cut maple to a sixteenth of an inch or a thirty-second of an inch. Well, how do you do that? Well, there are ways to do it. If you will uh, go back to the slides there, the first two. There you go. Uh, I used 
to cut stuff on my own. I don't have a saw stop. If I was starting with working today, I'd have a saw stop. But I worked for 40 years with a Delta Unisaw. It tilts this way. The, unis the saw stop tilts that way. It's wrong for me. When I step, I, when I go to Mark Adams, they have saw stop. I have to stop. I have to stop and think before I do anything. Well, that blade's going the wrong way. So I, I'm used to a Unisaw. That's what I've always used. All my jigs fit the Unisaw. I've got a whole stack of push blocks mounted on the side of my bench. I never push anything across with my hands. I always use a push pick. I've got this long, this long, this high, all kinds. So I always use a push pick. Worst thing you can do is, I was always taught that this is the insert you put on your saw. Never have your hands anywhere where the insert is. Your hand should always be away from the insert. You don't want to be in here trying to cut them. So if, you, if you're safe, uh, then I think you can get by with, a, with an old saw. But if you're new and just starting out, don't know what you're doing, you better have a saw stop. You might hurt yourself if you don't. But, uh, I, I use a Unisaw. That is, a, that is an old model 100 Sears type, cast iron table saw. The first good table saw I ever had, just like that. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world because I've been using a little nine inch table saw. And those are really pretty good saws. The only bad part about them is the fence that they're going to get. But uh, you can find these on Craigslist, eBay, um, uh, Facebook Marketplace. I paid $25 for that one. Made me a base for it, changed the bearings out on it, cleaned it up, put a new belt on it, and I discovered the next slide. And I installed a different kind of fence on it with an aluminum, aluminum fence. And that's an old, some of those adjustable fences that they make nowadays, they make them for router tables and everything else. Can't hear them. No, Incra jig. It is an Incra jig. When Incra jig first came out, they made out of plastic. And that's, I got that in a shop, I bought that. It was still new, got never used it. I had it for years, and I said, I can use it on this saw. The modern, the modern ones, the better Incra jigs, maybe they were metal, they're better than that one. But that one works perfect, and it adjusts in 64th degree increments. So I set it up on that, on that uh, old sear saw. I don't use that old sear saw for anything except you know, like small cuts. I use this blade. Noblo seven and a quarter inch finish blade. These are great. They cut a sixteenth of an inch curve exactly. And I use them on my Unisaw. If I'm not cutting a big piece, I put one of these on there. They're so cheap, you don't have to get them sharp. You can throw the things away. Home Depot sells a two pack of them a couple of times a year for $19.95. Ten dollars a piece. They make a forty tooth. They make a twenty-four tooth. They got both. Uh, the twenty-four tooth. You're ripping. You're going to rip a long piece. Twenty-four is better. Cross cutting the forty is better. But they both cut really well. I've got six or seven of them. Use them all the time. But you need a zero clearance insert. You don't want. One of the worst things about I use zero clearance tip inserts on everything I do. Everything. Because the most dangerous thing you can have on any table saw is a gap between your blade and the throw plate. Stuff will fall down in there, and it will tear out the back, the back of your cut. You've got a zero clearance insert, and worry about that. I have a friend. If you don't think you can get hurt with a with a saw stop, you can. A friend of mine has a saw stop. Got the splitter on it. Got everything you can get on it. He had a trapezoidal shaped piece of wood. And he was wanting to square it up. So he put one edge in there. So he cut off like an inch and a half on the front end, paper down to nothing on the back end, over a length about that line. <clears throat> so he's standing at his saw stop. The blade's right here. His hand is back over here. He's watching the cut. Has a push stick. Pushes it through there. There's just enough clearance between that blade and the throat plate that when it hits that feather edge at the very end, it goes down into the groove, the wood comes up, wham, hits his thumb, breaks his thumb, knocks his thumbnail off, and it's this far from the blade. It just caught, and so you've got an inch and a half 
one inch thick, inch and a half wide, tapered piece of wood that gets caught in there and covers down like a hammer. Wham! And hit his thumb. So, I don't know, we talked about what we could do to keep that from happening again. And when I went to Mark Adams, I told them about it. And they, they now have a safety practice up there that if you're tapering a piece, the taper's got to be on the front end. You can't have it on the back end. In other words, you can flip the board over so he took the flat feather on the front and got thicker on the back. I would have never thought of that and, until he hurt himself. You know, he was moving. He turned this off. Some of the best lessons we learn are after we made the mistake. That's exactly right. So anyway, you put this, you know, cut you a piece of plywood, use half inch plywood, put Allen screws on the back to level it all up. Put it in the saw. Run the blade all the way down, put it in the saw, clamp a board across the top, bring the blade up to it to cut this first clearance. Once you get that cut, take it out, set it back up on the saw to that distance, and cut the rest of it so that the groove goes all the way through. Glue in a piece of 1 16th inch plywood in that groove, because that cuts exactly the 16. Glue you in a piece of 1 16th inch plywood right on the front of it, and you've got a splitter built in. And that's what I do. I've got bunches of these. So um, let's go back to that slide there a minute. And I have successfully cut. I think I've got some here somewhere. Yep, this. I use a lot of one eighth inch square holly. That's one eighth inch. Put that on that side. Oh, this was good. This was good using that setup right there. Is there one more picture? Yeah, that one. And you, you can see how you can adjust that over. Now, I would take like a three quarter inch or one inch piece and rip it this thickness. Then turn it over and rip it this thickness to get the square out. Now, when you're going to rip this thin piece, you need to clamp. Let's see if I've got a, another picture there. No, no. Uh, anyway, visualize this. This is your zero clearance insert. You've got, you're going to cut this little thin piece off. The fence is right here. You take another piece of wood and you clamp it to the fence with the, with the strength, with the thickness of the board you're going to cut in there under it. Clamp it to the fence, pull this out. So now this is the thickness of that above the surface. Bring the blade up into this. So now your blade is completely covered. You can't get your hand in. And it will hold down these little pieces across the blade so it doesn't go from and tear up. So you put that little clamp on there and you just feed them through. And they'll come out the other side. There's, there's some examples of what you I cut those on that side. Do you then have to resize them in your other little tool? I, I can't, oh yeah, occasionally have to do that because I'm not perfect, you know, I know it's chatting a little bit, and you do have to do that. I have gone so far as to try to bunch them together and run them through a um, sander. That handy love. Hey, the sander would pick them up and you know, it just didn't work. Just, just try to be as active as you can and use that little tool to size it. Here's another one, we're talking about sizing. Here's another one. Uh, you make this one out of a uh, scroll saw blade, jigsaw blade, and the blade is ground at an angle, and it works the same way. You just... <laughs> you notice I put the air on there, so I don't know which way it happens. YouTube video, this guy show you how to do this. And that's where I learned to do it. This works the same way. Okay, 
a oh, fa fancy adjustment on this. Oh, feel the back of that. Run the finger over there. Now that you can feel that burr? Yeah. Feel that burr? Yeah. Feel that burr? That's what does it cut. And it's got a slight angle to it. Burrs. What does it cut? Burr does it cut. We'll put that in there. That's about right. This one you have to hold it down. It's like a number 80 scraper. Yeah, just you need to leave that behind. Uh -huh. Leave that burr. Same sort of thing. Leave that burr on there. It's put, you can't see it, it's pulling this little fine, fine shavings off, which makes the profile of the inlay stream look like this, and exaggerate. And the groove you're putting in is like this. So when you put it down in there, you get a tight fit here and here. So that's another, another thing. You know, how, how much you got in there? A piece of wood and a jigsaw blade. Or you can buy one from Lee Nielsen, they'll show you one. It does the same thing for about $180. <laughs> well, and that, and that cabinet maker at Erion, he just said, here's the way I size my, size my inlay. Let's take a break. It's a little after 10. I don't want y'all to get too tired. And I need to rearrange stuff a little bit.